Good morning. Our opening words this morning come from James Baldwin, novelist, essayist, and civil rights advocate in the subject of today's talk. He says, whites and blacks deeply need each other to become a nation. To accept one's past, one's history, is not the same as drowning in it. It is learning how to use it. We have a little centering music here for you um, and hope that you'll sing along. We have uh, at my home calligraphy by Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, we attended one of his conferences and, and brought this home with us. And uh, it simply says, I have arrived, I am home. With the implication that I don't need to be anywhere else than here. So I said that music, and I don't think he will mind if we collaborated on this. Uh, and I'll sing it through once, and we'll do it twice more through, and I hope you'll sing along or hum along or um, mentally image yourself singing along, whichever works best for you. I have arrived. I am home. I am here. Peace is now. I have arrived. I am home. Peace is now. I have arrived. I am here. Peace is now. I have arrived. I am I am I am I am here. Peace is now. I have arrived. I am home. Thanks, Jane. That was wonderful. Uh, if you were a first time visitor or perhaps returning after an absence, if you were comfortable doing so, I invite you to wave your hand and you'll be called on to tell us who you are, where you are from, and perhaps what brought you here today. Please wait for the mic to reach you. Is there anyone with us? No. Okay. Oh, dear. So we write this challenge. Just a sec here. Huh? You can either stand on that or don't stand on that. Okay. Piece. You're going to. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry. My apologies. <clears throat> Sorry. Novice here. <laughs> Okay, we like this chalice to honor the memory of those who have come before us, kindling flames of wisdom in dark times, willing to challenge orthodoxy even at great personal risk, giving us a legacy of freedom and a love of truth, a legacy that warms our hearts and lights our paths. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Each Sunday we make time for those who wish to offer a joy or concern or sorrow or to set an intention for the coming days. As we share joy, it multiplies. When we share sorrow, it begins to lessen. Sharing an intention can give us strength. If you would like to take part in our stone ritual, I invite you now to come in silence to place a stone or stones in the sand at either of the two stations, one in the front and one in the back. Following this time, anyone who has a joy, concern, or intention that you wish to share aloud with the congregation, please raise your hand and someone will bring a mic to you. Is there anyone who would like to share aloud with the congregation? Our mic is on its way. I'd like to share a joy that uh, yesterday afternoon the Faith Club was held, and this was the cast premiere performance since COVID, so I know they really appreciated the uh, the turnout, and um, I must thank those that felt comfortable enough to come, uh, were able to uh, to come and, and participate. And I just want to share one takeaway. Uh, I think um, for me, what I've come to better understand is in terms of difference, people who are not like ourselves, one of the obstacles that challenge us uh, is this fear that we don't know enough and we're going to say something dumb and so we don't engage in people who are not like ourselves and what I have learned is people who are different from me um, whatever that difference may be if I ask questions there's always an opportunity to learn engaging people are always willing to share people love talking about themselves so we just have to be you know, courageous like these three men were to me for over two years to engage in dialogue that at times required them to be courageous, but they ended up learning so much. So this is one takeaway that I wanted to share from the program last night. Wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to answer that. Um, I have a joy and a concern. The joy is that I was here with this program. And I had seen that, it's been here twice before, and I was here at least for one of those, maybe for both, I'm not sure. And it was almost like brand new to me. I'm not quite sure why. I think maybe because things have gotten so much worse since the last time. But what struck me is that after the program, I was talking to the ladies to perform, and, and I said to Nura, who played the uh, Muslim, um, I thought your tears were real at first, and all back then said they were. It was very moving. I, I thought she's either a supreme actress or her tears were real. And it, it strikes me that someone who has lived here for so long 
and gotten, you know, should have been able to blend in with society, still, when referring to the stresses placed upon them because they're different, uh, can't express herself without bringing tears to her eyes. And there are so many people in this country like that uh, because, because of so many differences. And that's my concern. So I have both joy and concern from yesterday. <coughs> I am a domestic partner for the past six years and a long time member. Um, will probably be transferred to Cornerstone Hospice either today or tomorrow. Thank you. If there is anyone who has not been mentioned that you hold concern for, please feel free to name them aloud at this time. And those attending Zoom may unbrief, unmute briefly. Janine, Bernie, you know. yeah. Danny, um, <coughs> Kit. Kit, Bill. We will enter, we will now enter into a time of silence, meditation, being mindful of the joys and concerns we have just heard. Take a moment to find a comfortable posture and let the chime draw you into mindfulness. Terry's lovely music will then bring us back. Please join me in reaffirming who we are by reciting together our congregational covenant found on the screen. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant, well together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. It is our practice to give generously to our church as we are able, keeping in mind both its meaning in our lives and its impact on the world. We are thankful to all who provides financial support for the UUCLC. There are multiple ways to do this, which are found on the slide, in the Sunday Service Bulletin, or in our UUCLC website. For those who are here today and wish to contribute, you can leave your contribution in the wooden box located on the table in the narthex just outside the sanctuary doors. Thank you for your donations today. I'm joined on stage by my friend Jan Sheldon. Um, we're going to do a song called One Sweet Song. 
you'll hear a reference to ragtime music in here and um, mentioned uh, over Facebook to my friend Carl Dantino that we'd be doing the song today. I put in that line about ragtime music because Carl and his group, Ragtime Relics, they go to nursing homes and play music that older people, there aren't that many people around older than me, but older people appreciate uh, that would be familiar to them and um, they do this pro bono. So um, Carl's a left-handed guitarist. That's a rare breed, uh, but he's a rare breed for, for his service to others too. This is one sweet song. The whole wide world sings one sweet song can you hear? February 18th, 1965, the lecture hall at the Cambridge Union of Cambridge University in England overflowed with an audience 
primed and ready to witness the debate between American civil rights advocate James Baldwin and William F. Buckley, the founding editor of the conservative magazine National Review. Arranging for this debate had been a very delicate operation. Baldwin, who was living in France at the time, was opposed to the idea of traveling, given the fact that he was recovering from a serious illness. But Baldwin's publisher argued that the visit to England would help to promote Baldwin's new novel. And ultimately, a London publicist convinced the author to undertake the trip. Aided by Baldwin's sister, Gloria Davis, the publicist succeeded in delivering James Baldwin to the hall for the debate on that February evening. William F. Buckley was one of the great acid tongued orators of his generation. So it was no problem to convince him to travel to England from Switzerland, where he and his wife were enjoying their annual extended vacation. The fact that his wife had experienced a skiing accident that delivered a compound fracture to her leg the day before was not going to deter Buckley from showing up for a major debate. He did fly back to his wife the next day, however. The two men who would lock horns in that lecture hall did not come from the same background. Baldwin was born in 1924, and the, he was the grandson of slaves the son of a mother who had migrated north to Harlem from Maryland. James's stepfather, David, was a bitter man who had also migrated from the South, only to end up there in the biggest black ghetto in America, scratching and clawing for a living. James was a loving elder brother to his many siblings, all of whom feared the violent rants of their father. Faced with the drugs and violence, out on what he called the streets, James not only turned to religion, but actually became a preacher at the age of 14. His ardor for Christianity cooled after a while, but his ability with words found him editing his high school newspaper and experimenting with various sorts of writing projects. To distinguish himself as a writer became his lifelong goal. And his commitment to writing on behalf of civil rights for his fellow African Americans ultimately rendered him, as William Styron once put it, one of the five or six most famous people on the planet. Born a year after Baldwin in 1925, William F. Buckley was raised in the mansion of a wealthy Connecticut family, where he was homeschooled before spending a year in an English boarding school, and then going to the prestigious Millbrook Academy. While at Millbrook, he espoused right-wing politics advocating for the America First movement, the effort led by Charles Lindbergh to keep America from interfering with Adolf Hitler's plans to dominate Europe. After graduating from Yale, Buckley spent some time in the army serving stateside. When World War II ended, he worked for the CIA for two years and then went on in 1955 to found the leading conservative publication of his era, National Review. That's the magazine that Albie Singer, in the Woody Allen, who's the Woody Allen character in Annie Hall, is horrified to find in Annie's apartment. I'm trying to get all points of view, Annie argues. Albie treats the magazine like a stick of dynamite. For many years, Buckley hosted the public affairs interview show Firing Line and came to be considered one of the leading public intellectuals of the last half of the 20th century. He considered himself both a conservative and a libertarian. And to put it mildly, he had no use for progressives, much less outspoken ones like James Baldwin. It should be noted that the positions of both men on the issue of race in America had been rather clearly expressed by the time they agreed to the 1965 debate. In the summer of 1957, Buckley penned an editorial for National Review entitled why the South must prevail. This title might suggest that the editorial was written in 1857 rather than 1957. And in fact, the content of the piece is predictably retrograde. Buckley contends that white people have established a level of civilization that black people simply cannot achieve given their limited claim on full humanity. Quote, the white community is the advanced race, unquote. 
He contends, therefore, that they're justified in taking whatever measures are necessary to ensure dominance of society. These measures, we may recall, involve lynching, beating, kidnapping, false imprisonment, and as television news broadcasts were beginning to reveal in the early 1960s, attacks upon peaceful demonstrators with police batons, fire hoses, German police dogs, German shepherds. These measures were justified, according to Buckley, in order to maintain what he called civilized standards. Buckley has a habit, as we shall see in the debate, of referring to civilization as if it is a concept under attack by African Americans. How dare they endeavor to obtain the opportunity to vote, a right granted them nearly 100 years prior to their appearance of Buckley's editorial. Here's a quote from why the South must prevail on that subject. The great majority of the Negroes of the South who do not vote do not care to vote and would not know for what to vote if they could. We can easily picture the great majority of the Negroes of the South responding to that piece of unsubstantiated bull by casting an ironic grin at Buckley and challenging him and his ilk to give them the vote. We'll see, I can picture them declaring, if we can figure out who deserves our support. This seminal issue of voting rights arises during the debate from an interesting source, as we shall see. As we turn now to James Baldwin's 1963 book, The Fire Next Time, a book that Buckley refers to with considerable inaccuracy during the debate, we find it divided into two parts. Baldwin begins the book with a letter to his nephew, his namesake, a 15-year-old boy growing up in Harlem and facing the same racist challenges that confronted Baldwin himself. That section of the book is entitled My Dungeon Shook. Some of you might have seen reference to this letter in ta Coates's 2015 book entitled Between Me and the World, which takes the form of a letter to his son. Coates emphasizes that the concept of race was hatched out of racism itself. It has no specific scientific basis. We are all one human family after all. But if you happen to be born black in America, Coates tells his son, the wind is always at your face and the hounds are always at your heels. In other words, 50 years after the publication of Baldwin's book, The Fire Next Time, the uphill battle to establish an identity and the sheer danger of day-to-day -day life are still the essential facts of being Black in America. Here's how Baldwin sums up that challenge to his nephew, James. You can only be destroyed by believing that you really are what the white world calls a nigger, a worthless human being. And then he goes on, please try to remember that what they believe does not testify to your inferiority but to their inhumanity and fear. I'd like to emphasize that in this letter and elsewhere in his writing and speaking, James Baldwin never ceases to enunciate his hope that love will prevail in America. One expression of that emphasis on love is his declaration to his nephew about his family. If we had not loved each other, he says, none of us would have survived. Further along, Baldwin offers his, this assessment of white Americans. They are in fact still trapped in a history which they do not understand. And until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. Baldwin would undoubtedly be as discouraged as many of us are today at the evasion of our racist history that the GOP and in particular the current governor of Florida have tried to ensure. The phrase frightened of his own shadow comes to my mind when I consider the sort of craven activity that has led to the effort in high places to maintain white supremacy in America. The effort to expunge from school books and libraries any reference to America's racist past is a sad testimony to the operation of fear in the lives of white supremacists and their political supporters. The second and by far the longer segment of Baldwin's book, The Fire Next Time, is entitled Down at the Cross. 
A brilliant writer and observer, Baldwin is particularly interesting when he gives us an account of what transpired when he was invited to dine with Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Black nationalist organization called Nation of Islam. Baldwin resisted the effort of the Black Muslim leader to recruit him to the Black nationalist cause. His account of that argument put forth by the leader to convince Baldwin of what was necessary to save Blacks in America makes riveting reading. Baldwin had his own way of looking at the racial situation. And as we prepare to discuss the debate with Buckley, let me share with you a passage that we find near the conclusion of The Fire Next Time, as Baldwin gives his account of what white and Black Americans must do, given the dire situation that he has described. At the center of this dreadful storm, this vast confusion stand the Black people of this nation, who must now share the fate of a nation that has never accepted them, to which they were brought in chains. Well, if this is so, one has no choice but to do all in one's power to change that fate, and at no matter what risk, eviction, imprisonment, torture, death, for the sake of one's children, in order to minimize the bill that they must pay, one must be careful not to take refuge in any delusion. And the value placed on the color of skin is always and everywhere and forever a delusion. I know that what I'm asking is impossible, he says, but in our time as in every time, the impossible is the least that one can demand. And one is after all emboldened by the spectacle of human history in general, and American Negro history in particular, for it testifies to nothing less than the perpetual achievement of the impossible. Those I would contend are the words of a realist, but not the words of a person who despairs of reconciliation between whites and blacks. Baldwin did not after all join the nation of Islam. As we now begin to consider what transpired on February 18th, 1965 during the debate itself, I would ask you to keep in mind the words that we just heard and the tone in which Baldwin states that blacks must of necessity do all that they can to ensure that America will overcome the racial divide and thrive as a nation, as impossible as that task might seem. I bring this to your attention because Buckley would time and again misrepresent the tone and the content of the fire next time, acting as if Baldwin was calling for the annihilation of American culture. Now the actual proposal that the moderators put forth to be debated there at the Cambridge Union was as follows. The American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. Following the tradition of that debate series, two students spoke briefly, one on each side of the proposition, the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. David Haycock, speaking in the affirmative, illustrated very compellingly the disenfranchisement of blacks in Alabama. His student opponent, Jeremy Burford, staked his argument on the claim that there had been undoubted improvements in race relations in the last 20 years. Coming on the heels of David Haycock's description of the treatment by the police of peaceful black demonstrators, this idea that blacks were enjoying any essential improvement in conditions must have seemed both naive and unconvincing to those present in the hall. Sheriff Bull Connor, sicking his dogs on demonstrators and blasting them with fire hoses is not anyone's idea of the actions of a Birmingham social worker dedicated to improving the lives of Blacks in his community. When James Baldwin rose to speak, he first endeavored to put the audience in the shoes of a Black person growing up in America. It comes as a great shock, he says, around the age of five or six or seven, to discover the flag to which you have pledged allegiance, along with everybody else, has not pledged allegiance to you, and that America has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. He goes on to say that by the time you're 30, you realize not only that nothing you have done has helped you escape the trap, 
But what is worse than that is that nothing you have done, and so far as you can tell, nothing that you can do will save your son or your daughter from the same disaster. Speaking of the American economy, Baldwin notes that cheap labor is at the heart of the American dream. I picked the cotton, he says, and I carried it to market, and I built the railroads under someone else's whip for nothing, for nothing. The Southern oligarchy was created by my labor and my sweat and by the violation of my women and by the murder of my children. Thus, Baldwin offers himself standing there in the lecture hall as the living embodiment of a system that far from extending the American dream to blacks has made no accommodation for them at all in the culture. Little wonder that Baldwin left America for Europe, a place where he could at least expect to be treated as a human being. White people in the South, he says, have one enormous knowledge and consolation. At least they are not black. They are driven by this ingrained truth to do terrible things to black people. The system has pushed them into a pattern of behavior that is actually subhuman. They lack all empathy for fellow human beings whose color is different from theirs. Has there been any progress toward better conditions for blacks in America? Well, the Civil Rights Act had been recently passed, but Baldwin professes little hope that the stipulations of that legislation would be honored any more than the 15th Amendment had been honored for the previous 100 years. Jim Crow seemed to him still dominant. Baldwin concludes his argument with a powerful call for an awakening to the reality of the condition of American culture. It is a terrible thing for an entire people to surrender to the notion that one ninth of its population is beneath them, he says. And until the moment comes when we, the American people, are able to accept the fact that I have to accept, for example, that my ancestors are both white and black, that on that continent we are trying to forge a new identity for which we need each other. And they am, I am not a ward of America. I'm not an object of missionary charity. I am one of the people who built the country. Until this moment, there is scarcely any hope for the American dream because the people who are denied participation in it by their very presence will wreck it. And if that happens, it's a very grave moment for the West. As Baldwin sat down, there was a long and enthusiastic standing ovation that greeted his presentation. A reaction on the part of the audience that in itself sorely tested his opponent's vaunted, vaunted acumen as a debater. But true to his reputation, William F. Buckley came out slugging. And he did so by trying to destroy the very foundation upon which Baldwin's eloquent, eloquent argument was based. Buckley stood and scanned the room and stunned everyone by saying that it was impossible to deal with Baldwin's indictment of the American system unless one is prepared to deal with him as a white man. In the BBC video of the debate, we see a puzzled Baldwin trying to grasp what has just been said, this truly nonsensical notion that he would now be addressed as a white man by his opponent. And it doesn't stop there. Buckley continues, the fact that your skin is black is utterly irrelevant to the argument that you raise. He then goes on to accuse Baldwin of speaking with British accents in threatening America with the necessity of jettisoning our entire civilization. Actually, as we've just noted, Baldwin's ultimate point was that if Americans didn't take seriously the project of working together toward realizing the American dream, there would be grave consequences. And by the way, the idea that Baldwin spoke with what Buckley called British accents is a bunch of malarkey. If you'll access the debate on YouTube, you might well agree that if anyone spoke with an artificial accent on that evening throughout his career, as a matter of fact, it was Buckley. So having misrepresented Baldwin's argument, not to mention his tone, Buckley proceeds to try to trash his character. He claims that Baldwin is treated in America with a kind of umptuous servitude, which in point of fact goes beyond anything that was ever expected from the most servile Negro creature by a Southern family. 
He goes on then to cite a bunch of statistics about deaths worldwide in order to claim that the number of people who've been lynched in America has been vastly overstated. The moderator tries to get Buckley to address the actual proposition at hand, but Buckley merely reiterates his absurd claim that Baldwin is calling for American civilization to be, in Buckley's words, jettisoned. He goes on to claim that America has shown more concern for the plight of blacks than any other civilization in history has shown for the plight of a minority. He charges blacks with failing to show the kind of initiative towards social progress as Jews, Italians, and Irish Americans, conveniently ignoring the fact that blacks were brought here in chains and after the Civil War were the victims of systematic campaigns by Southern whites to terrorize any blacks who had the temerity to try to establish themselves in business or professional practice. Moreover, the white citizens councils in every city and town in the South made sure that any white people who tried to support blacks paid dearly for those efforts. No mention of those realities by Buckley. When Buckley rather coyly challenges the audience to offer suggestions about how to deal with the failure of Blacks to take effective steps to alleviate their problems, an audience member rises to be recognized and suggests, one thing you might do, Mr. Buckley, is to let them vote in Mississippi. Buckley claims at first to agree, but then he pulls out of, a hat, out of his hat one of those rhetorical rabbits a specious twisting of language to try to render absurd that point made by the audience member. The problem, he says, is not that enough, is not that not enough Negroes are voting, but that too many whites are voting. He gets a laugh from the audience and then grins broadly at his triumph in sweeping the subject of disenfranchisement of blacks under the rug. Buckley then concludes by chiding Baldwin for his negativism when, according to Buckley, Blacks simply need to take advantage of the wonderful social mobility that America affords to them. In the end, he contends, the fundamental friend of the Negro people in the United States is the good nature and the generosity and is the good wishes, is the decency, the fundamental decency that do lie at the reserves of the spirit of the American people. The audience could be forgiven for wondering where that decency was to be found when armed Alabama state troopers swung their billy clubs at the head of John Lewis as he marched with other peaceful demonstrators on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. Buckley himself is known to have wept when he received news of the indecency of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, where four little girls died for their effort to attend Sunday school on the morning of September 15th, 1963. Good nature, good wishes, and decency are to be found in abundance in this room and in many such gatherings on this morning throughout the country. But let's not pretend that it's anything but raw racism that we are at this moment in our history as a nation trying to counteract. Let alone in 1965, when Buckley was so sure that James Baldwin's warnings about consequences were exaggerating the problem. It's encouraging that not long after the Cambridge debate, Buckley began to see the light. In a 2017 article in Politico, Alvin Felsenberg reports this. In August 1965, after the Voting Rights Act became law, National Review praised the seriousness and hope and quiet pride it detected on the faces of African Americans lining up to vote in the South. It made reference to the religious roots of the civil rights movement and foresaw a major transformation of the region. Five years later, Buckley rejoiced in his column that so much had changed. Much still needs to be changed, obviously, but we can look at the vote taken at the end of the debate on that February 1965 evening at the Cambridge Union as a sign that Buckley's essential racist arguments didn't have a leg to stand on. A healthy 544 of those present voted in favor of Baldwin's argument that the American dream was at the expense of the American Negro. Only 164 voted in favor of Buckley's argument to the negative. Would it be asking too much of the American electorate 
to hope that the same majority of 75% would vote for enlightened leadership for our communities, our states, and our nation in the upcoming November election? I would hope so, because I would argue alongside James Baldwin that Blacks and whites must find and will find the means to engage in a cooperative effort to solve the racial problem in America. We are, after all, in this together. Thank you. That was a heavy dose of the reality of life in America, I know. And um, we hesitate to leave you on that note. <laughs> um, so we're going to do something kind of peppy. But I'd, I'd like to hark back to uh, the years around 2002, three, four, five, six, when the Eustace Street Grill back in downtown, was the place to be on a Friday night. And um, there were some wonderful people who were still in this community uh, who gathered there on Friday evening. And this is the kind of song that I've written and would never have written at the Houston Street Grill had it been a place to take your new material and try it out on people. This is a song called Dance Me Silly. And um, you're invited to sing along in the chorus. You'll get used to it, I think. Right, we'll start with the chorus. Thank you. 
As I extinguish the chalice, let's be mindful, be grateful, be positive, be true, and be kind. Shall I give the closing words? Uh, I got closing words. Okay, good. Our closing words are in the form of a poem by Langston Hughes. The poem is entitled I Too, as in T-O-O, -O, I Too. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen. When company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen. Then, besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I, too, am America. We're closing music, but this is a little humorous meditation. I wouldn't know a thing about Buddhism except that my wife is very dedicated to learning about other cultures and other religions. And I kind of like what has come to me by osmosis. And so um, I've got a little song here called uh, You Can Dial It Back with Buddha. And you'll, you'll hear that for openers and at the end. This is a truncated version of the song. It cuts out two of the verses, but you'll get the, the chorus, the bridge, the chorus again, a final verse, and the chorus. So you can join me on the chorus because it's real simple. It's, you can dial it back with Buddha. A lotus blossom floating in your smile. You can dial it back with the Buddha. Change your pace. Smooth your style. Change your pace. And smooth your style. Sharks in the cool. Respiration, meditation, breathe. You're a cute woman. And you can dance with the Buddha. Lotus plus floating in your smile. Let your mood percolate. You'll love 
to the words of uh, Joseph M. Marshall III in his book, The Lakota Way. Truth is the marker along the roads we travel in life, my grandfather once said. The good red road has many markers. If you choose the black road, there is only the illusion of truth. We can be influenced by truth or by illusion. The choice is ours. <laughs> 